happy Veterans Day. Um, it's really a special privilege to be the speaker at the museum on this day. Uh, I did speak here before, February 18, on the hump operation. Uh, February 18 would have been my father's 105th birthday. And so uh, I need to pause and introduce you to, uh, because my dad and mother are figure into this today's presentation, uh, I have my father's granddaughter, uh, Elon Green, who is with Department of Defense uh, Healthcare. She's a policy uh, administrator. And I have my father's great granddaughter, Cora Green. If you could wave, she is, among many other things, a, a champion uh, uh, swimmer competitor. So it's just a family event to have them here today. I'm so, so happy you came down. Um, also, on February 18th, I met, just my eyes are adjusting to the dark here. I met Bill Roche. Uh, he, that day, he uh, came up and talked to me after my talk. He has been a much loved figure here at the museum. He is featured in today's talk, so I dedicate this presentation to Bill Roche and his family. His son James came up to Broomfield to saw, see this talk at the Veterans Museum, so uh, he has uh, uh, seen this. And I also want to introduce my collaborator, author, historian, uh, Mike Martin. If you'd just stand up real quick. Uh, this. I have wanted to do the story uh, of April Girl for years, and then when I finally met Mike, it all came together. So thank you so much. Uh, a couple introductory remarks. Uh, I grew up in Washington, D.C. and in a Cessna aircraft family in Wichita. My dad was VP. Because of him, three generations of our family have enjoyed flying, yet dad never talked much about the war. In his autobiographical notes, all he left us from his World War II experiences was a total of six sentences. And I think that's probably uh, something that many other families have experienced with veterans. Uh, so this story would have been lost except for my mother. Late in her life, I discovered she'd kept hundreds of letters and records dad had sent home from the war. Uh, I wrote two books. They got Dad inducted into the Kansas Governor's Aviation Hall of Fame, and that started me doing these talks. Yet, uh, I hope this is about much more than history and nostalgia. Uh, here's a story of World War II. It was a time that was a pinnacle of American civilization, when Americans were so united in their shared identity, goals, and principles of honor that they saved the world from a global fascist threat in under five years. David McCullough wrote, history is a guide to navigation in perilous times. Nowadays, we Americans are faced with perils, both foreign and domestic. So we study veteran heroes to learn courage and wisdom from them to help us in our own time in history and so that we can continue to have a nation that's worthy of them and what they did. I hope that's what these history talks and museums like this are all about. The aircraft in this museum are magnificent. The American history they evoke is, is sacred. Here's the story of April Girl. I call this a combined history because I'm sharing real stories about real people in a real airplane, yet I'm combining them into a singular biography about a World War II B-17 and Colorado heroes who served aboard B-17s. Much of this is derived from two books, two nonfiction books by Colorado authors, my own Among Stars Above the Storm about my father, and Steel Fortress by Michael Martin, no relation, uh, maybe, maybe we're cousins, uh, about his father. So about 40% of this talk is about Mike's dad, uh, Harold. The people in this story are related to Colorado. That's what most intrigued me about putting this together. Uh, let me introduce them to you. Frank Martin, my dad, delivered B-17s to the 8th Air Force in Europe for the Air Transport Command. These were pioneering all-weather transatlantic operations. Mike Klein, Broomfield resident, B-17 tail gunner on 36 missions, many over the hazardous target of Schweinfurt, Germany. 
I knew him through his work at the Veterans Museum, Broomfield, and I was a guest in his home at Anthem Ranch when he advised me on my book. Her name was Liesel. I knew her in Broomfield as an elderly real estate client. She had been a Hitler youth in Schweinfurt and told me what it was like when 300 B-17s attacked her home. Her father was killed rushing her to a bomb shelter. Bill Roche was a B-17 waste gunner. I met him just this year here at the museum when I did the, the talk on the Himalayan hump. He had been an active volunteer here. We had a wonderful conversation. It greatly humbled me. He passed away just four days later. Harold Martin was a B-17 engineer and turret gunner, the main protagonist in his son's book, Steel Fortress. He also flew missions over Schweinfurt. So, except for my dad, who may well have delivered April Girl to Europe, these people were indeed present in Schweinfurt on one or more fateful days in World War II. It is then quite easy to imagine, using this combined uh, literary device, that they are together again, 40 or 50 years later, as indeed they were in Colorado, if not face to face. Had they been, perhaps at a church or community social, I have imagined their astounding realization at having been together before all those years earlier in and over Schweinfurt. We will see that even April Girl can be imagined at that 1980s gathering, despite the ignominious demise of this illustrious warbird in an Arizona scrapyard. When I was a young lad, my mother took me to the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in Washington. Then I had only a vague notion that my father had flown the B-17 in World War II, yet I was enthralled by this giant mural there. <clears throat> The B-17's role in World War II made it an iconic symbol of burgeoning American power in the world and the promise of triumph over the Axis forces. My mother said the B-17 was the most beautiful man-made object she'd ever seen. Maybe that revealed a, a charming romantic notion in the heart of a young woman toward one of the airplane's pilots of her acquaintance. This is the cover art from Broomfield, Colorado author Adam Makos' book, A Higher Call. It's one of the finest books on World War II aviation I've ever read. Uh, Adam spoke last year at the Veterans Museum World War II Symposium in Broomfield. The feature film Devotion is based on another of his books. The story of this Luftwaffe pilot escorting this crippled B-17 to safety over the channel, despite knowing that he would be executed if found out by Nazi command, uh, well, it'll make you shed a tear. The two pilots became close friends after the war. The B-17's ability to absorb intensive damage in combat, keep flying, and bring its crew home was legendary. The magnitude of human sacrifice and ultimate victory that it brought to the war made this one of the most romanticized airplanes in history. Few other aircraft types can be associated with so much human drama. April Girl likely was born in the Seattle factory of the Boeing Mili Military Airplane Company. B-17s rolled off assembly lines like automobiles. The Seattle plant reached a production level of up to 16 per day. Many more were built elsewhere in all. 12,731 B-17s were built. That production level eclipsed modern aircraft manufacturing volumes. The United States produced over 300,000 aircraft in World War II of all types. Production outpaced the availability of pilots. The logistics of just delivering this many aircraft to the theaters of war challenges credulity. It took nearly a half million men and women to crew B-17s during World War II. In combat over Europe, nearly 26,000 Americans died in them. So it was likely that April Girl's first delivery crew were women Air Force service pilots, WASPs. In this story, they fly April Girl to Salina, Kansas, to an Army Air Corps depot in preparation for delivery to war. In Salina, my father in the Air Transport Command is on the next crew. Mechanical reliability was challenging in World War II as these guys in the museum know. The, the B-17 prototype first flew just 30 years after the Wright brothers. New airplanes required a good deal of break-in and debugging. 
Dad's flight starting on April 8, 1943, was a reflection of this. They pre-flighted the factory fresh B-17, but on run-up they found a radio transmitter was not working. That repair took until the next afternoon. Then, immediately after takeoff, number three engine lost oil pressure and had to be shut down for a return to base. The maintenance officer decided to change out that engine, which took two days. Next takeoff, the same engine failed again. A few hours later, the airplane was declared ready. They took off, same problem. The problem in number three was found to be in the oil cooler system, and the engine change out had been unnecessary. Yet next day, the primer line on number three broke. That delayed departure for several hours. Then the number two engine lost power on run-up and was found to need new spark plugs. They finally got away the evening of the 12th and flew to Memphis. Next day, from Memphis to Newcastle, Delaware, number two became finicky and near Richmond, Virginia lost oil pressure and they were unable to feather the propeller for shutdown. Its windmilling imposed so much drag that an immediate landing was required at Bowling Airfield, Washington, D.C. They added 35 gallons of oil to that engine, and it ran fine all the way to Newcastle. Salina to Delaware had taken only five and a half days. At the Newcastle base, many combat crews joined the aircraft. They would be flying on bombing missions over Europe for familiarization training on the flight across the Atlantic. Most were barely emerged from adolescence. Many would never return. Dad and other instructors who had gone before on the challenging route tried to not discourage the courageous resolve these new flyers were trying to muster in themselves. Dad remained the uh, aircraft commander until the ship was delivered to Presquick, Scotland, or other European depot. He told of his dismay at having to teach aircraft fundamentals to these crews headed to combat over Europe. He said, they didn't even know how to use the throat mics. Microphones in the B-17 were to be worn around the neck and worked through throat vibrations to keep the mouth open for talking or shouting in the cabin and to allow the wearing of an oxygen mask. Many tried to hold the microphone by hand and talk directly into it. In the rush to war, training of the mass numbers of new airmen was often less than comprehensive. These young men had already run a frightful gauntlet to get this far. The Army Air Forces lost over 15,000 aircrew in training accidents alone in World War II, compared to 26,000 bomber combat losses over Europe. My mother had moved with her new husband to Newcastle and became the base commander's secretary. Remarkably, this gave her a front and center role to Dad's missions on these overseas flights. Against regulations, Dad took crews home to my parents' Wilmington apartment where Mother would prepare the last home-cooked meal many would ever have. By this point in the war of the men Mother and Dad had for dinner in their small apartment, it is probable that one in five to one in four were killed in their B-17s. When I was age 13 in 1966, Mother drove me for a weekend to Wilmington from our home in Arlington, Virginia. She wanted to find the old air base. She was about to give up finding any remnants of her past in Wilmington when we drove by a construction demolition site. She stopped the car and looked quizzically at the half-destroyed structure. Then she jumped out and told me to stay in the car. She crossed the no trespassing barricade and entered the ruined building. She climbed the shaky stairway and as I followed she told me to stay back. At the top stair landing, I found her looking around the ruined walls and sagging ceiling. Then she reached up and peeled a piece of the wallpaper from the crumbling plaster. As she stood and held that wallpaper scrap in both of her hands, tears began running on her face. I asked what was wrong. This is our wallpaper, she said. This is the apartment. She had found what she'd been seeking on our drive to Wilmington, a scrap of memory of her own valorous days there, and she wept again for those men of the 8th Air Force remembered as boys who dined beside that wallpaper in her newlywed apartment. On a spring afternoon in 1943, Mother sat at her base office window overlooking the runway. Her mood was sullen. A half hour before, she'd taken her leave of Dad as he climbed aboard a B-17 for a transatlantic delivery flight. She was used to his long absences. His prior flight was down the South American coast and across to Africa. She knew he'd be gone for weeks. She watched him taxi out and take off and then return to her office. 
As she gazed out her window, trying to get back to her duties, she watched a B-17 settle gracefully for landing and bounce gently. As the bomber rolled out on the runway, a main gear suddenly collapsed. The bomber slid sideways, dragging its left wing in a trail of sparks. Her boss, the base commander, yelled, Come on, Sally, and they jumped in a jeep out to the plane. When they got to the airplane with tilted wing and bent props, it was Dad standing on the wing. Number three had failed again on climb out. They circled back to land and then had the landing gear problem. Boy, was he mad kicking the Cali and cussing that plane, she later said as she would tell the story. Two days later, they departed again. From Newcastle, the route proceeded to Presque Isle, Maine, to an air base that had exploded into existence in the midst of this quiet village of farmers and fishermen. This sleepy town had suddenly become a major interchange on the highway in the sky to war, with multitudes of heavy bombers, transports, and fighters arriving and departing at all hours. Flying from Presque Isle over Canada toward either Goose Bay or Gander north of the St. Lawrence River, the cartographer's art and the science began to fade from the aeronautical charts of the time. Depictions of river courses and mountain ranges became dotted lines leading to the notation unexplored. Gander was another fishing village transformed into international airport. Goose Bay had only been a tiny native village and Hudson Bay Company outpost. Now that pristine wilderness happened to be strategically positioned for flying the North Atlantic and was suddenly intruded by bulldozers, airstrips, and operations buildings of the Royal Canadian Air Force ushering their own along with the flood of American air traffic to war. The next leg of the journey was nearly 1,300 miles across the Labrador Sea. Weather forecasting was random and speculative. The most reliable weather reporting was from the weary and famished pilots themselves, sharing what they'd just been through as their paths crossed in operation shacks and mess halls. They also advised each other to place their trust in a holy trinity, God, Pratt, and Whitney. <laughs> Technical note, however, the B-17 is powered by Wright Cyclone engines. North Atlantic navigation was limited to dead reckoning, radio direction finding, and star fixes with an astro compass, which generally only worked in a cloudless night sky. Radio beacons were transmitted from Canada, Greenland, Iceland, and the British Isles. German U-boats out to the south transmitted identical signals from wrong headings. Many crews became disoriented during these long flights in severe weather at night, distracted perhaps with a concerning mechanical problem, and they followed the false signals to fuel exhaustion over the ocean. Iceland could be missed with a navigation error of 50 miles, and approaching aircraft had to carefully identify themselves with ever-changing call codes. If the ID was not satisfactory to ground controllers, radio navigation aids might be shut down, and when flying blind on instruments, that would be a serious problem for pilots. With the right prevailing westerlies over the North Atlantic, it was sometimes possible to fly nonstop from Gander to Presquick. That was a 12 to 13 hour flight. A restored B-17 operated by LibertyBell.org visited Broomfield in 2007. Her pilot, a lad in his 20s, yet older than most of the World War II pilots who flew the B-17 in combat, explained to me that they were about to fly her to England to participate in a British anniversary observance of D-Day. When I began to recite the route he would fly, he was surprised that I knew. In 2008, Liberty Bell made her flight to England amid much fanfare by BBC News. News outlets in the U.S. where this history originated largely ignored the story. Tragically, in 2011, Liter Lib Liberty Bell was destroyed in a forced landing in an Illinois cornfield. All exited unharmed, but a fuel leak consumed the aircraft. <clears throat> in 2006, Frank Martin's granddaughter, Cherie, flew on the British Airways, very comfortable flight from Denver to London, across the North Atlantic, nine and a half hours nonstop by Boeing 777. My father's November 27, 1943 B-17 flight departed Newcastle to Presque Isle, but then was delayed for days by weather in Maine and Gander until the 6th when they flew on to Presquick. It was a nine-day trip, 
compared to his granddaughter's nine-hour trip in 2006. <clears throat> Dad's return to the States proceeded through London by train, then by airline to Ireland, Portugal, Gambia, Trinidad, New York, and Philadelphia, returning home on December 22nd. That was almost a full month to deliver one aircraft. Consider then the logistics of delivering 300,000 aircraft to war in World War II. In Steel Fortress, Michael Martin writes of a similar North Atlantic crossing by his father, Harold. Only on this flight, Harold Martin rode in the belly of a B-17 with a dozen other enlisted men, one of hundreds being flown across the Atlantic. In the deafening sound in that freezing skeletal interior, riding in a, sl in a sling seat, sleep was impossible. There was a, this was a 14-hour flight from Goose Bay to the southern tip of Iceland for refueling. A boy of about 18 was taking readings on the North Star in the Astrodome. Harold mused to a colleague, didn't they use those instruments in the 12th century? Can't the Army get something more up to date? Before long, they flew under clouds and entered turbulence. Hail began thrumming on the fuselage. The radio man was following a coded directional signal from Ireland, but the storm interrupted the signal. Suddenly, the signal came back loud and clear, which didn't seem right given the storm. He showed the coordinates to the navigator. It didn't make sense on the charts. Conferring with the pilot, they decided a German sub had figured out their frequency and was luring them out over open water. <clears throat> but they anxiously worried if they were making the right decision. It was a crossroads in the sky, two directions, same frequency. The pilot remarked, if the Germans are sending a fake signal, we could lose some planes in this storm. Finally on the ground, <clears throat> Harold and crew were watching incoming bombers landing in clouds of snow. The planes of some comrades never arrived. The next morning, three bombers were still missing. They would never be seen again. Harold's crew proceeded by train to Polebrook Base, north of London. As soon as they unpacked their duffels, they were taken to a lecture by the squadron commander. They were told, Gentlemen, you are virtually unprepared for combat, in spite of your stateside training. Truth is, despite the readiness training you will receive here, half of you will not finish your 25-mission tour of duty. You have been told of the combat efficiency of the B-17. That is simply not true, and you have been misled. So, my advice to you is not to think too much. Just take it one day at a time and do your job well. You may make it out of here alive. The men were stunned. No one saw this coming. They learned about surviving the below zero temperatures and 170 mile per hour winds that ripped through open portals in the plane. Freezing was a deadly problem. Oxygen masks froze at high altitude, killing crews regularly. The low pressure at altitude caused headache, nausea, and poor coordination. Exertion caused cramping and fluid in the lungs and brain, resulting in death. They were briefed that if parachuted behind German lines, outraged citizens had started lynching American flyers or clubbing them to death. If they fought back, the Gestapo would execute them. They were informed their time was close. They would be flying their first mission any day now. Allow me to place three of the men in this story in their positions aboard the B-17. Harold Martin, who I've just discussed, was in the dual role of flight engineer and, when needed, top turret gunner. Bill Roche, who we will discuss in a bit, was a waste gunner. Mike Klein, our friend at the Veterans Museum in Broomfield, was a B-17 tail gunner. I met Mike Klein at the Veterans Museum, Broomfield, Colorado. Later, I was guest in his home as he advised me on my book. Mike was 18 when he joined the Army Air Corps in 1943. He served as a tail gunner on B-17 bombers in 36 missions over Germany, attacking critical industrial targets, including Schweinfurt. There is a wonderful video of Mike's presentation on his experiences posted at the Veterans Museum YouTube channel. Search Mike Klein World War II. <clears throat> 
In that video, Mike tells of visiting Washington, D.C. war memorials in recent years with a group of fellow veterans. He said that they ask each other if they had talked to their families much about the war, and most realized they had not. Mike said that opened a Pandora's box in his thoughts, and he told the delighted audience, now you can't shut me up. <laughs> Meeting Mike put me in remembrance of my mother cooking dinner for those young B-17 crews. Though Mike was over 35 years my senior, I couldn't help but see him as one of these, those brave young men that mother cooked for that dad may have flown to Europe. Did he serve in one of the aircraft my father delivered to England? Mike flew many missions on the extremely dangerous target of Schweinfurt where the heavily defended Nazi ball bearing factories were. Might he have been over Schweinfurt on a day when my Broomfield client, Liesel, was rushed to the bomb shelters by her father? Mike emphasized a few recollections to me as we talked. One, he drew comfort from the fact that his B-17 had an escape hatch for the tail gunner. The hatch door was mounted backwards, so if it was unlatched, it, unlatched, it blew off the airplane and made escape much easier. <clears throat> Mike was also thrilled to fly with the new P-51 escort fighters, airplanes that finally had the range to provide real defensive cover for the bombers referred to as the Little Friends. In an interview at the National Museum of World War II Aviation in Colorado Springs, where he did much volunteer work, Bill Roche explained, I decided to try to be a pilot when I turned 18, and I volunteered to enlist in the Army Air Force in late 43 when the Air Corps was losing a lot of planes. Every time they lost a flying Ford or a Liberator, they lost two pilots, but they lost five gunners, and at that time the impetus was to replace the gunners. So 42 of us were designated to go to gunnery school. I ended up being shipped to Buckley Field, Colorado, right near Denver, way out in the country at that time. He became a B-17 waste gunner assigned to the 8th Air Force Bomb Group and flew combat missions in B-17s. He was shot down twice. I met Bill just this year in February when I gave my talk on the Himalayan hump operations here at the museum. He came up afterward and told me he had always wanted to know more about the hump operation. His son, James, told me he had canceled a doctor's appointment to attend my presentation. I told him I was thrilled to meet a B-17 waste gunner and to have the honor of having him there. Bill passed away four days later. After the war, he had had, had a distinguished career in, the, in Air Force intelligence. He was a faculty member at the Air Force Academy. He had air attache posts in the Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia, and he was with the CIA until 1992. He was 98 when he passed. Harold Martin had flown his first half dozen missions in several different B-17s. From the first mission, the stress of fatigue and terror were beyond anything training had prepared the crew for. By 1944, operations had become a war of attrition. The invincible flying fortresses they had trained on at home were now being deployed as bait for German fighters, so American fighters could pursue and follow to their bases. Command was prepared to lose two-thirds of the bombers, 7,000 men. In April alone, 537 bombers and 191 American fighter planes were lost. That's close to 5,500 men. The calculation was that the Germans would lose more faster. Now, history narratives and casualty reports toss out simple numbers like this on human life. But 537 is just a number. In tribute to these lost heroes, it's Veterans Day, so let's have a moment of silence to look at that number graphically. <clears throat> now, that's just the B-17s lost in the month of April plus 191 fighter aircraft. These are the 8th Air Force losses in men and airplanes in just April 1944. 
Harold, a rookie, was advised, get lucky. If you're hit, get out quick. You only have 30 seconds, and here's a little clue on how to fight this war. Pretend you're dead already. The rest comes easy. And the much-touted precision bombing capabilities that claim that the Norden bomb site could drop a bomb in a pickle barrel from 20,000 feet was becoming a crapshoot. Targets had to be hit multiple times to inflict significant damage. With fighter escorts pursuing enemy fighters, the B-17s became target practice for the enemy. And precision bombing tactics against military targets gave way to area bombing. That was a euphemistic term for non-precision targeting of civilian populations, such as Dresden. Here's a bibliography note. A key classic source for B-17 studies is Flying Fortress by Jablonski. For more recent research on the Norden bomb site and World War II area bombing uh, is this quite amazing book that will change many historians' view on accepted beliefs, The Bomber Mafia. And I can't give too much praise to Michael Martin's book. Hundreds of books out there on the B-17, yet I have never read a more complete and spellbounding minute and hour by hour account of missions. This book brings a whole new light to B-17 operations and combat technology. And well, uh, we mustn't forget Among Stars Above the Storm, which is one-third B-17 operations and two-thirds the Himalayan hump operation, my other signature presentation. Harold Martin's crew first met April Girl when she is assigned to them as their airplane in April 1944. As the crew gathered around her, the captain said, Well, fellas, the Army brass thought we should have our own plane now. I guess they thought we couldn't screw up any worse than we already have. The colonel says we have to take good care of her. He says she's a lucky plane. Nobody knew how to take that as they looked up at the big bird. Army flyers were a tad superstitious, and nobody wanted to jinx it by saying some offhanded wisecrack remark about what they'd already been through on missions. April Girl was already a legendary aircraft. Part of its reputation as a lucky plane came from a mission the previous year when she was called April Girl 1. It was shot up so badly that after it landed, one of its wings separated from the fuselage as she came to a stop. The mechanics wanted to scrap her, but the colonel who flew her prior ordered the ground crew to rebuild her. That's when they discovered two unexploded 20 millimeter cannon shells in one of the fuel tanks. Technical note is B-17s, like uh, many aircraft, had self-sealing tanks. So when it was hit with these shells, they would have they would have patched the skin and not known about it. Nobody knew how long the live shells had been there. April Girl was rebuilt and renamed April Girl II. Harold pointed to the top turret and announced, I'm going to put my name right up there. When the restored B-17 Liberty Bell flew every few years over the Boulder Valley, the Thorian thundering of those Wright Cyclone engines resounds off the mountains for miles around and viscerally penetrates the senses. It's a sound rare in aviation today and nearly lost to history that evokes a bittersweet nostalgia of the World War era. So now it is not possible to experience this sound multiplied 300-fold across European cities as the 8th Air Force flew bombing missions on a daily basis. Liesel was my real estate client in the 1990s. In her childhood in Schweinfurt, she had been a Hitler youth. By the late 30s, this was mandatory for Aryan children. It's one of history's most frightening mass indoctrination programs, conforming the collective consciousness of literally millions of children to the bigoted hate of one man. A study of the Hitler Youth and other Nazi social engineering programs is key to explaining the Holocaust. Lee Sol had once presented flowers and a box of candy to Hermann Goring who was, somewhat ironically, the commander of the Luftwaffe defending German skies against the B-17s. She described to me the B-17 raids of her childhood, of hearing this fearsome sound slowly build in the air long before the bombers appeared from over the horizon, signaling her family to flee for the shelters.
She told of how the bombers approached in massed formations, dimming the sun, filling the sky, just before releasing their terrible destruction upon her world. Her father was killed rushing her to the shelters. A central theme of this presentation is Schweinfurt, Germany. As I discovered the amazing stories of these people who indeed were in Colorado in the 1980s to 2000s, I realized Liesel and several of the others had also been in Schweinfurt. If not at the same time, then certainly under the same conditions. Had I written this as historical fiction, I imagined them coming together in Colorado, <clears throat> perhaps at a church or community social, and then suddenly discovering astoundingly that they had been together before 40 years earlier. But let me stick with the facts and go now on a real bombing mission to Schweinfurt. Factories in Schweinfurt produce ball bearings. Note here that the Nazis had their own Rosie the Riveters. Allied command named ball bearing production as the second most vital German industry, believing that all other weapons production depended on it. In 1943, the famous raids were launched on Schweinfurt Regensburg. Many books have been written on the tragic losses suffered by the 8th in these raids, but the strategy was flawed. The Germans had built up enormous reserves of ball bearings and were receiving supplies from Italy, Sweden, and Switzerland. Yet, the raids continued on into 44 when this mission of Harold Martin's occurred. It was Harold's 28th mission. Note that the promised tour of duty of 25 missions was now being extended due to crew shortages. This would be his crew's last mission together. All were quiet and somber. This day would impact Harold the rest of his life. They passed 10,000 feet, donned oxygen, and settled in for a long flight at 30 degrees below zero. They were listening to Jean Krupa on a German radio station when a sultry female voice came on. Hello, you B-17 boys. Are there any of you left? We haven't forgotten about you Luftgangster baby killers. We know you're coming to our beloved homeland today. See you soon. Enjoy the next song. It will be your last. Approaching Schweinfurt at 25,000 feet, there was a smokescreen cover over much of the area. Harold was watching out of his top turret. From a cloud bank to the right came another squadron of B-17s crossing in front of them. The lead plane of the encroaching formation collided with the bomber next to them. The two planes exploded in fire. Harold's plane had to fly through the trailing smoke, flame, and debris. He sta stared in horror at the line of wreckage falling behind. He yelled out, I don't see any shoots. They arrived over the target, and 30 tons of explosives were dropped. Yet the big guns on the ground had not started firing, and there were no flak bursts. The Germans had been waiting to spring a trap. Suddenly, hundreds of 88 millimeter cannons opened fire. Calamity and hell broke loose in the airplane. <clears throat> a violent explosion sent everyone not strapped in flying out of seats. The waist gunner flew upwards and was knocked unconscious. Shards of metal ripped through the plane like bullets. Cold wind roared through the newly punched holes. In the belly turret, the gunner was unconscious and bleeding behind a web of cracked plexiglass and metal. His oxygen supply was broken and he was suffocating. The pilots were steering around flat clusters and checking to see what was still working. Harold then saw that the bomb bay doors were open, but the bombs hadn't dropped from the racks. Cabin temperature had dropped to 60 below and ice was forming on the decks. Next, he turned his attention to the belly turret. <clears throat> The navigator, with leg bleeding, came to help. They cranked the turret around until the hatch came up, but it was jammed. Harold used a hammer and crowbar to pry it open and held an oxygen mask to the gunner. They pulled him up, blood streaming off of him, freezing on the floor. They shot him with morphine. Harold then focused on the sound of the engines. They were whining and straining. The plane was slipping sideways and losing speed, but worse, the bomber smelled like 100 octane fuel. Harold ran to report to the pilots that the doors were stuck and the bombs were still on board. The pilot told him engines one and two are failing, 
I still have speed, but we're losing fuel off the port wing. Harold checked gauges, low oil in number one. The wing was peppered with holes. The outside engine was smoking. It had to be feathered while it still had some oil. The pilot told him if they lost another engine, he couldn't maintain altitude. They had to lose those bombs quick. The pilot flew toward a rail yard. As Harold tried to attend to the bomb bay door, he found the leak in the gas line spitting gas on the floor. He spliced that, then went to the jam door with a hammer and crowbar, hanging off the narrow catwalk, trying to beat the hinge off the mount. He was blasted by the freezing wind. He leaned out the bomb bay while his crewmates held onto his parachute straps. The door moved and the pilot shouted that the bombs were live and about to drop. Harold realized he was hanging underneath one of the thousand pound bombs, but he still needed to knock the hinge loose. When he did, the bombs would fall. He gave the hinge one more blow. The door flew open in the slipstream. His crewmates pulled him backwards just as the bombs fell away. There was more to come. The pilot yelled, we're steering like crap. Number one is almost done. Number two is hot and blowing oil. Oh, and we don't have a radio. They fell, be fell behind the group. On the retreating turn, they were hit by another flak burst. Number four spewed smoke and quit with a shudder. Fuel in the tank behind the engine spewed out all at once when the wingtip exploded. Aileron control cables broke and the airplane went into a starboard yaw and drop. Harold had to keep number two and three running. Oil pressure was down to one half as were hydraulic levels. On number one, the propeller was running away with oil and smoke. Pieces of the engine were falling off the wing. Then Harold briefed the pilot. There's something else. We don't have enough fuel to make it back. The pilot replied, okay, let's steady the plane and see what we have left to work with. Let's lighten the load. They started throwing radios, torn navigator desks, 50 calibers, shell boxes out the open bomb bay. For the next hour, the pilots used every trick to save the remaining engines and keep the bird airborne. Harold spliced control cables, electrical lines, and severed hydraulic lines. Still three hours out from base, fuel, fuel not looking good, they were still too heavy. They came over the North Sea, losing altitude, and with no radio, couldn't call for rescue. The pilot juggled prop controls, feathering one to cool it, increasing pitch on the other to compensate for thrust. Nothing but the cold North Sea below as they slowly dropped. If they ditched, 15 minutes in the water would kill them. Now below 10,000 feet, they tossed oxygen bottles and heat suits overboard. Then, Harold noticed the hydraulic reservoir was two-thirds empty. He needed boost pressure for fuel pumps and engine control. If they lost prop pitch and cowling flaps, they would drop. They would lose brakes, flaps, and landing gear, but they had to worry about that later. With ailerons gone, the pilots were steering with rudder and differential power on the two remaining engines. Harold and crew started tearing up floor panels, gun mounts, and anything else they could unbolt. Then they set to unbolting the belly turret assembly. They worked furiously, but it took quite a while. Finally, the framework was free, but the turret was stuck. The men kicked at it as hard as they could. In a rush, the entire turret assembly dropped away from the airplane, leaving a gaping hole in the floor. The white caps below looked terrifyingly close. No one believed they would make landfall. They put on life jackets and waited for the signal to ditch the plane. Still an hour and a half out, number two was smoking worse as Harold kept pumping oil to it. Control cables were popping off pulleys as fast as Harold could pry them back on. After 20 more agonizing minutes, the white cliffs came into view, framed in golden sunlight. They had picked up a tailwind and descent slowed, but the airplane was dropping under the horizon line. As the towering Dover cliffs approached, they had to power up the dying engines once again and try to finesse a bit of climb. They pushed primers and turbo pumps for all they had to get one more bounce out of the bird. The engines redlined, needles were buried, but the plane began to lift. In 40 more minutes, they approached the base. The captain ordered the gear lowered by hand crank. As he lowered the flaps, they began to roll back, but with a protesting sound, the last DC battery gave out.
Then Harold went to open the hydraulic lines to the brakes, but the needle was on zero. He opened the reservoir, it was empty. He was in a panic, out of ideas. The pilot pumped the brakes to test them, his foot went to the floor. Harold needed any liquid he could find. Coffee in a thermos, a water bottle, melted ice on the floor. Just then, number two started windmilling, trailing black smoke, causing enormous vibration through the aircraft. The temperature gauge pegged red. There was no oil left to feather the prop. Suddenly, Harold had an idea. He called the crew to huddle around the hydraulic reservoir, unzipped flight suits and flies, and made them all pee into the container. He closed the lid just as the bomber lined up for the field. The airplane was flying on one engine, slipping to one side and falling out of the sky. The fuel ran dry. They dropped to the runway. The plane shook violently as wheels skidded sideways. The pilot hit the brakes hard. The brakes screamed, smoked, and burned through hot urine. The number two engine seized in a cloud of black smoke. The bomber finally came to a screeching, rattling stop. Minutes passed as the plane sat hissing and smoking, a, a sickening sound coming from the number two propeller still spinning. The stunned and shell-shocked crew spilled out of the hatches. They stood gathering their wits and turned to the sound of the spinning propeller. The gears in the drive assembly had disintegrated, causing the drive shaft to shear. As they watched, the propeller slowed down, unscrewed itself from the broken shaft, and fell to the ground with a huge thud. No one moved at this very odd sight, but after what they'd just been through, they just mutely looked at each other, trying to take it all in. Now this sounds like a scene from the movie Memphis Belle, doesn't it? Uh, but both stories are true, and Mike's book details many other missions. 62 years after this mission, Harold was in a hospital recovering from a stroke. He abruptly awoke from an unsettling dream and shocked his family in the room by shouting, No shoots. I don't see any shoots. The indestructible April Girl was flown on 111 missions. In October 1944, she was severely damaged again during a mission to Mannheim, Germany. The crew was able to fly her to Sweden, but they and April Girl were detained by the Swedish government. Sweden was officially neutral in the war. The flyers were treated well but kept under house arrest. Many American prisoners of war were kept busy repairing aircraft they were, that were forced to land on Swedish soil. April Girl was given permission to fly to England and two and a half months later and continued in service. After the war, she was flown back to the United States. If, like me, you are subject to a strange nostalgia for faithful and heroic old machinery, um, I've personally driven this Chevy truck for 52 years. It's known in local car shows as my time machine. Then uh, you will share my melancholy when April Girl finally meets her end, not in combat over Europe, but after 111 heroic missions always bringing her crews home, she is sent to an Arizona salvage yard to await her final fate in the crusher. My dad's logbooks show that many of his last flights for the Army Air Corps were rounding up these veterans and flying them home to the guillotine. At war's end, there was no government, Air Corps, or Navy effort or program to spare any of these aircraft that had been critical to restoring peace to the world. Except for limited post-war surplus missions in transport and firefighting, the B-17 was now obsolete. Yet, us nostalgic historians could stand before the old war bird in the scrapyard in wonder at what she would say if she could tell her stories. So much effort, so much history, so much human drama. That sentiment reflects the historic importance of organizations like the Commemorative Air Force that has saved and restored 180 World War II aircraft to date. We have the mile-high wing of the CAF ba based right in Broomfield, Colorado, and of course the National Museum of World War II Aviation has 
a truly amazing collection of airworthy World War II aircraft right here in Colorado Springs. But thousands of warbirds were smelted into aluminum ingots. So there's one further irony in the story. April Girl herself could have been at least partly present at that imagined 1980s community get-together. By the 1980s, it was estimated that up to 40% of aluminum beverage cans once flew as World War II aircraft. After delivering B-17s to Europe, my dad was deployed to India where he flew 66 missions over the Himalayan hump. That's what two-thirds of my book is about, and I've done that talk for a number of years to many groups. In 1984, Dad and I toured the Commemorative Air Force Museum in Texas. I was just then beginning to understand his epic World War II experiences. I asked him what he thought of our museum tour that day. He said, a bunch of grown men playing with toys. That remark may sound cynically pedantic, uh, but he did not intend it that way. My father had seen these aircraft in war and he had been their master. His enthusiasm for old war birds was far more nuanced and introspective. So as you tour these rare and wonderful World War II aircraft, consider the sacred spirits of heroism, tragedy, and victory that inhabit them. That day at the museum with dad years ago as he gave me pointers on pre-flighting a B-17 and especially when we saw a C-87, a hump veteran, he indeed did shed a few tears. Thanks so much for listening. At my website, fredtmartin.com, a Speakers Bureau of Author Historians is offered to any group, school, church, charity on history, World War II, and aviation topics free of charge. Thank you very much.